community uh, throughout the world. Father Zacharias yes. has been visiting uh, far and near uh, for many years, uh, different monasteries, institutions, uh, all of which who have appreciated uh, his sacramental word which he offers to the world. It wasn't uh, for, without reason that Father Sophroni sent Archimandrite Zacharias to get his doctorate, and his doctorate, uh, his PhD dissertation was uh, Christ Our Way and Our Life. It's the book that's available from St. Econ's Press, and it's the distillation of all of Archimandrite Father, uh, Father Sophroni's teachings into a very clear and concise uh, exposition uh, for us to understand the teachings of Father Sephroni and be Father Zacharias has distilled all of Father Sephroni's teachings down to their most basic and most palatable, most edible, digestible form. I guess you could say you're the apostle of Father Sephroni <laughs> and of St. Silouan, bringing to the world that word that is so life-giving and so necessary for our time. He speaks that modern life-giving word, that, that contemporary word to us, uh, just like the fathers of old, so it's the same word given to us in a contemporary, contemporary word today. So we're so blessed, we're so privileged, and I hope that you appreciate the, the magnitude of, of Father Zacharias and the teaching that he brings to us today. Uh, I hope that you have an open heart uh, and an open uh, disposition to, to receive that life-giving word that he, he will give to us today and that he has been giving us all weekend. Uh, so without further ado, we'd like to welcome uh, Father Archimandrite Zacharias. sisters, I, I beg your forgiveness from the start. I'm just going to say a few things about domestic theology. The only theology I know which is domestic theology, what I learned from my father founder of the monastery, Father Sophroni. And the theme is asceticism in, in Archimandrite Sophroni, ascetical theology. Positive, negative asceticism and positive asceticism. As the Holy Church, as the Holy Church chants, Christ is the extreme desire of those that love him. Once man is drawn towards the person of Christ, he is inspired to strive to become like him. The fuller his contemplation of the person of the Lord is, the more inspired will be his struggle to fulfill the commandments of love and the greater his resemblance to his Creator. Asceticism which regenerates and transforms our life in harmony with the Lord's Spirit depends on two factors, the will of God and man's choice. The first element is infinitely great and the second is infinitely small yet absolutely necessary if both are to work together successfully. Archimandrite Sophroni discerns two kinds of asceticism. He calls the first, the first kind negative and the second 
positive or charismatic asceticism. In the first, the human factor prevails and man fights against the law of sin which, which works in our members. In the positive kind of asceticism, spiritual activity is prevalent, leading man to an increase in what is good and acquisition of the fullness of divine love. In the first kind of asceticism, man undergoes a painful and extreme effort to convince God that he belongs to him. When he has convinced him, then unexpectedly a miracle occurs which exceeds which exceeds all that he would ever think all, all that he could ever think of and astounds his heart. He is illuminated by the uncreated sun which comforts and gives peace to his soul and captures his intellect with new contemplation. This contemplation is inspired by a vision of God who is humble. It kindles human nature and transforms its early energy into an impulse of love. At this point, asceticism becomes charismatic. In other words, the grace of God labors more for man than he does himself. The soul is filled with an aversion for sin and the hidden depth of corruption which she bears within her. She is possessed by a strong yearning which can be likened to severe thirst, to imitate the God of love and to be pleasing in his sight, to be pleasing whether by death or life. This inspiration is so abundant and renders the believer's life truly charismatic to the extent that this Father Sophroni says, asceticism is no more. The Apostle's words to overcome evil with good are fulfilled in exactly the same manner as finally mortality will be swallowed up of life of immortality. The first kind of asceticism which consists in putting off the old man of sin and passions is of longer duration and leads to the second kind of asceticism, the positive putting on of the new man who has been regenerated by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Positive or charismatic asceticism, as mentioned above, is inspired by a humble contemplation of the person and example of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, the disciple, fulfills the commandments in both kinds of asceticism, albeit not, the, albeit not to the same extent. He places himself on the way of the Lord and follows him. Since he is the way, man has him as a fellow traveler and is guided to the Heavenly Father and to an abundance of life which he granted us through his only begotten Son. Therefore, which, whichever asceticism Whichever asceticism man, man adopts in his life, the example and the way of the Lord are of absolute importance to him if he really desires to be united with Christ. In order to obtain spiritual gifts, man must keep alive the memory of the humble vision of the face of Christ and constantly place himself on his way. The example and the way of the Lord are a wellspring of inspiration and strength for the disciple 
who is desirous to attain spiritual perfection according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Humble con contemplation of the person of the Lord has been described by many prophets, by most precisely and with the greatest wonder by Isaiah. By most precisely and with the greatest wonder by Isaiah. This prophet foresaw Christ as wounded and bearing our sins, brought as a lamb to the slaughter. His way was also hymned by the righteous of the Old Testament. In fact, the prophet Baruch, blessed Israel, blessed Israel for his knowledge of this way. Happy are we, O Israel, he says, for we know what is pleasing to God. In an even more astounding way, the righteous of old foretold that the way of God is a person and has its foundations before the ages in the council of the Holy Trinity. This was the Lord man or the lordly man, man Kyriakos Anthropos, which God would fashion from the Virgin to do his work for the salvation of the world. This is from the prophet, Proverbs. You find that in the Proverbs. The same vision also predominate, predominates in the teaching of Archimandrite Sophroni. He does not seem to come back to it and to stress his distinguishing marks. In two places, he presents this with an especial clarity and completeness. We shall show the first in this. He presents and describes the following original image and theory, whereby he shows Christ's way, which leads to the righteousness of divine love and the freedom of the children of the Spirit. Argument right Sophroni says, that humanity is like a pyramid with different <coughs> social levels. The division and inequality which exists among them is a consequence of the fall of Adam and Eve. The people at the top of the pyramid exercise dominion and authority on those under them, whilst justice which is demanded by the spirit of man, created in God's image and equality, is not found. In order to heal all humanity, to solve the deadlock of injustice and inequality, and to lift up all those who are downtrodden, Christ turns the pyramid upside down, placing its summit on the bottom, and there establishes the final perfection. Of course, the summit of the pyramid is Christ himself as head of the body of the new creation. At the summit of the overturned pyramid reigns the humble and saving spirit of the, cru of the crucified Christ, who it was expedient that he should that he should die for the people. According to Archimandrite Sophroni, according to Archimandrite Sophroni's revealing words, there we remark a quite a special life, a quite a special light, and a special fragrance of the spirit. Christ is the master and servant of this self-emptying and indescribable love. His love is absolute and perfect in its every manifestation. It proved itself perfect before the Heavenly Father through his taking on of the servile form of man. 
perfect likewise before men through his obedience and acceptance of the cross of shame. He placed, he placed his will in the hands of, of the Heavenly Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. He offered his body on the cross and lowered his holy soul into hell for the salvation of all. He himself confirmed that greater love than that greater love hath no man than this. The perfection and greatness of Christ's holiness as it was revealed in his divine self-emptying and humble love seized Archimandrite, Archimandrite Sophronis spirit with wonder to such an extent that he says to live a Christian life is impossible. All one can do as a Christian is die daily. This death is principally released in the sphere of, ment of, of mentality and in the actions of the old man and is a journey downwards toward the summit of the inverted pyramid following Christ daily. We can therefore see that the way of the Lord is a journey downwards. His word, he that humbleth himself shall be exalted, is its inviolable law. This law is twofold, that is, only when we first obey ourselves in a downward movement of the spirit does the ascent follow. The Apostle Paul says that Christ descend into the lower parts of the earth and his ascent far above all heavens was the cause of all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Having therefore a humble contemplation of the twofold way of the Lord, Archimandrite Sophroni confirms that those who are led by the Holy Spirit never cease condemning themselves as unworthy of God. We have said the other night that the greatest commandment in the New Testament is found in the Gospel of St. Luke, Luke, chapter 17, verse 10, when the Lord says that when you have accomplished all the commandments, say to yourselves that you are useless servants and you have done that which you ought to have done. They constantly go downwards with the desire of making themselves of no, of no importance. They imitate Christ, struggling to empty themselves in every tendency towards pride, and in this way become a dwelling place of God in the Holy Trinity. <coughs> Archimandrite Sophroni emphasizes that in the ascetic journey downwards, under self-emptying precedes the fullness of, per of perfection. No, sorry. Archimandrite Sophroni emphasizes that in the ascetic journey downwards, utter self-emptying precedes the fullness of perfection. The fullness of self-emptying precedes the fullness of perfection. In other words, the worth of spiritual gifts depends on the depth and consequently the degree of self-emptying which the Christian reaches in his journey downwards. We, we, I, it comes to my mind the psalm, a verse from the long psalm. My soul is down to the ground, be divine me according to thy word. That is to say, when you become nothing, we become suitable material for the Lord, for the Lord to refashion us. It's the property of the God of Christians to create from nothing. The way of the Lord extends through death even to the infernal regions of heaven. It was a voluntary and, sin and sinless deed. Likewise, man's journey downwards must be voluntary and in accordance with the Lord's commandment. Before the Lord Jesus was glorified, his way provoked amazement 
and fear in his disciples. After the descent of the Holy Spirit, these same disciples departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name and rejoicing in sufferings. <coughs> Following Christ's death and resurrection, death is abolished and the might of its fear no longer overshadows the way, now leading to eternal life. The work of repentance makes it possible to put oneself on the Lord's way and on the journey downwards. The essence of repentance is that man takes off the spirit of the flesh and puts on trust in it and puts no trust in himself but in the gift of God. He embraces the commandment of God with faith. He receives preliminary enlightenment and his heart is humbled. He acquires knowledge of his spiritual poverty and starts to be mindful of his sanctification and salvation by mourning and various other manifestations of repentance. He commences his journey <coughs> downwards. The extent that that his humility, to the extent that his humility and self-denial increase, so does the effort of repentance which cleanses of all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. In the early stages, his repentance is offered principally for himself. The journey downwards accords with the mind's descent into the heart, because the mind then is crucified with the precepts of the gospel. As the spirit of repentance is prolonged and becomes deeper, illumination of grace in the heart also increases. The Holy Spirit delineates there the form of our Lord Jesus Christ, depicts the form of our Lord Jesus Christ. When repentance has reached a certain fullness, the mind then finds the deep heart. It is captivated by the image of Christ and is amazed by the humility of his spirit. Man then has a real awareness of his spiritual poverty and his point of reference is the divine measure of Christ, who henceforth dwells in him. In humility finally exceeds human measures. It becomes indescribable divine humility. Therefore, the vision of man's spirit with the sp therefore sorry therefore the union of man's spirit with the spirit of Christ takes place in the deep heart. In the depths of his heart, the Christian discovers that his being is absolutely linked with, with the being of all humanity. That was the discovery. Of, of the Mother of God while she was in the Holy of Holies <coughs> praying. He then savors the grace and action of the love of Christ which overflows to the whole world and to all humanity. The love of Christ imparts to him the feeling that the whole race of men is an inseparable part of his existence. He then understands the commandment, love thy neighbor as thyself, in its existential dimension. By the conjunction as, as thyself, he perceives the ontological communion and unity of all men. Wherever he may be, he sees the world in spirit and lives its and lives its sufferings. 
he has the same disposition as God has for the world and is inspired by the, by the same love. He then repents and prays for the entire world as for himself. The humble image of Christ who came as a lamb to the slaughter and without resisting the evil one suffered for <coughs> the sins of all mankind makes known in the heart of the believer the Lord's love for man to the end. Christ's love to the end in the heart of its servant is transformed into the perfect love of self-hatred. In this state of self-hatred, he is firmly persuaded that if God be such as the crucified Christ made clear, then it is we and we only who are guilty of all the evil throughout the history of mankind. And all of these awareness and feelings are full of gratitude and love towards God. This conviction sets man's heart on the way of the Lord, detaches him from all things sin and temporal, and guides him into all truth, that is to say, into the fullness of the love of Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ, through his coming to the world and his sacrifice, perfected a body to which he transmitted all his power and virtue and glory in order that the members of this body become partakers of divine nature. I said the other night that God's mercy by coming into the world was manifested in the fact that he created a body, the church, to which he imparted all the worth of his gifts because he knew that no individual could accommodate all the gifts. We all accommodate a little part, a little, a little gift, but that is enough to attach us to the body of Christ and therefore to make us partakers of the fullness of the gifts of all the saints. We mustn't forget the passage from St. Paul's letter to Ephesians where he says that we can only comprehend the fullness of the love of Christ with all the saints. We can only comprehend the depth and height and length and breadth of the love of Christ only with all the saints, with all the members of the body of Christ. For this sanitary downward movement of the Lord to the infernal <coughs> regions, the only motivation was his, was his greater love. As his holy mouth asserts, greater love has no man than this, that the man lay down his life for his friends. Through his sacrifice, Christ justified at the same time both God and man. As God-man, he justified God by showing his divine love to the end for his reasonable creatures. For not only did the Father not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all, and of course with him gave us all things, but the Son consented voluntarily to give up his own life for us. Christ also justified men because he gave an example of obedience, so that whosoever follows his steps becomes likewise acceptable as a son or a daughter to the Father of the spirits and will live forever. Therefore the greater love of Christ functioned in this world the body, the body of the new creation, the chosen people, the spotless church. According to the teaching of Father Sofroni, monasticism is not a human device. It constitutes a categorical imperative of the spirit of someone who, who tastes the gift of the spirit of God 
and comes into contact with the fire of the greater love of Christ, love which sacrifices itself for the life of others and receives death from, from them. He gives life and receives death. Monasticism constitutes <coughs> a grateful response to, to Christ's sacrifice and in, it, and in its depths it is simply the fulfillment of his words. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it, will find it again. Monasticism is a distinguished fruit of the healthy life of the Church. It desires the same perfection of love that Christ manifested. It is a faithful imitation of the perfection of his life. <coughs> the acquisition of this perfection means the repetition of Christ's life on earth by every believer. All the commandments of Christ call us precisely to this perfection. Fallen man is found in such a state that he is unable to follow Christ in his descent. He is unable to go down towards the head of the inverted pyramid. The main impediment, the main impediment is pride. For pride, according to St. Siluan, stops us from loving. One single thought of vainglory and effaces the sensation of the heart. For this reason, the entire life in a monastery aims at acquiring the spirit of Christ's humility so as thereby to reach the perfection of his love. According to the teaching of the Apostle Paul, all the members of the body of the Church have spiritual gifts which witness to their incorporation into Christ. He does, sorry, he goes so far as to say that each member has his own special gift from God. But all the gifts of the Holy Spirit have flowed from the descent of Christ to heaven and his ascent to the heaven of heavens. Likewise, monasticism, with its lowly way of life, is nothing else than a manner of living which gives the greatest possibility for the monk to imitate the example of Christ's humility and become partaker of the gift of his spirit. Monasticism is the, great, the greatest approximation to the imitation of the life of Christ. Precisely in this lies its main value. It guides the monk on a downward path for the sake of Christ's new commandment. And certainly, the fulfilling of his commandment is life eternal. In the life of the world surrounding us, we observe the opposite we observe the opposite phenomenon. A struggle is waged for power. Each wants to rise above the other and to dominate those who are weaker. The real grandeur of man is revealed when before, when before the humility of his neighbor, he can humble himself still more and give all the space to his brother. The competition which is observed among those who are born of the Spirit is who will humble himself more before the other. This is a godly competition in humility amongst those who are born again in Christ and it is inspired by the way of life cultivated by the renunciations 
by the renunciation implicit, by the renunciations implicit in the monk's vows. The virtue of humility is an indispensable condition for discipleship to the Spirit of the Lord, as he, as he himself commands. Come to me, all who labor and are, and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It, it concerns, therefore, an art and the science which we must master if we, wish, if we wish to find the gift of life that the Lord bestows on those who follow him wherever he goes, as the book of Revelation says. The assimilation of this spiritual science and the transmission of the genuine spirit of the Gospels to the coming generations is the work and purpose of monastic asceticism. Christ's word to St. Silvan, keep thy mind in hell and despair not, was seen by St. Silvan as a great science. The teacher for this science is Christ himself, and the science, and the science is a matter to be studied and learned continually. Its content is the, is the humility of Christ, who, as the lamb without blemish and without spot, was led to the slaughter for the salvation of the world. Knowledge of this science is a divine gift, and it is indis indispensable for the successful outcome of spiritual warfare against the invisible enemies. Its humble spirit overcomes sin and fled and fleshly passions and makes of the monk's whole soul a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. St. Silvan says, I started doing as the Lord commanded me, commanded me to keep my mind in hell and despair not, and my mind was cleansed from every passionate thought, and the Spirit witnessed in my soul salvation. Whoever masters this science can be firmly established in the way of the Lord and have the Lord for a companion. He will be united with him and will possess the riches of his gifts. For as the Apostle says, Christ, having first descended to the lower regions of the earth and then ascended above the heavens, purified us from the dead, from the dead works of the flesh so that we may bear the spirit of adoption, the other comforter, and be led into all the truth of greater love of the Lord. That is to say, the greatest miracle is the descent of the Lord to the nethermost parts of the earth, even greater than his resurrection. When the, because the resurrection, it was normal. To, it was a, no, a normal outcome of his, of his holiness and his spotless sacrifice. When the apostles asked Christ to increase their faith, the Lord concluded his teaching with this advice. When you have done all that is commanded, you say, we are unworthy servants, we have only done what was our duty? This is the greatest commandment of the New Testament. We have seen that the Lord places as a condition of discipleship that we have our soul in, that we hate our soul in this world of the passions. That we hate our soul in this world of the passions, so that whoever he is, there his servant shall be. And the great science whose servant Sion became and his and the great science 
whose servant Simon became, says, If someone wants truly to repent and follow Christ, wherever he goes, and yet sees himself in the hell of suffering and separation from him, must voluntarily condemn himself as worthy of this hell for his sins. He must with faith and trust all things to the mercy of him who for our sake first descended to hell, to free us and raise us to the kingdom of his love. The truth of this great love, sorry, the truth of this great art was known to the prophets according to the words of Micah, who said, I shall bear the chastening of the Lord, for I have sinned against him. And of Daniel, to thee, O Lord, the justice, and to us, the shame face said, the, the shame faceness, the shame of the face. This wondrous science was prophetically proclaimed by the three holy youths in Babylon. They condemned themselves as worthy of the furnace, taking upon them the sins and iniquities of all Israel, which was then going through a stage of apostasy from the faith of the forefathers. And just at the moment, a fourth youth descended from heaven to the furnace to cool down the flame and to be a companion of the three youths in their unjust suffering. <clears throat> According to the confession of the tyrant Nebuchadnezzar, the appearance of the fourth was like a son of God. Imagine a pagan tyrant expressed, ex, ex, expressed <clears throat> that vision. The three youths prayed humbly to God of their fathers. We have sinned, we have committed iniquity in that we have a, in that that we have departed from thee. We have sinned in all things. We have not obeyed thy commandments, neither have we done as thou hast commanded us, that it may that it may go well with us. And thou hast brought all things to pass in righteous judgment and delivered us into the hands of our enemies. They were in the furnace and with the spirit they went even lower than that. In other words, the youths humbled their spirits and brought down their minds to the depths of God's judgment. <coughs> they accepted the, ch the chastisement of the tyrant and without despair, as we see from their words, but do not, they say, but do not forsake us unto the end for thy name's sake, and take not thy mercy away from us. It's very important, this part of faith, as we say many times in prayers. All the prayers of the church are divided into two parts. The first part is a movement downward. We say in the prayers before Holy Communion, Lord, though I am unworthy of heaven and earth and of this temporal life and so on, but I despair not of my salvation. That but is important, not to despair, but to have that but of faith. The three youths were, were prophetically placed in the downward direction which was to be revealed by the incarnate Son of God. They were on the humble path of the Lord Jesus, of the Lord Jesus descend into hell in a prophetic manner. Since the Lord, as he said, is himself the way, the three young men were deemed worthy to have as a companion the Son of God before he was incarnate, without flesh. It was he who came down into the furnace and was walking in the midst of the fire together with them, preserving, preserving them unharmed. The good thief is a wonderful teacher of this great science. 
hanging on the cross and, be and beholding with the eyes of his soul the hell which was about to swallow him up because of his works, he found the strength to converse, to confess courageously his own iniquity and the innocence of the crucified God. But indeed, he says, but indeed, justly, for, but indeed, we suffer this justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man, Christ, has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, then, having done that confession, then he said, remember me when thou when thou comest into thy kingdom. The power of his words, remember me. Remember me, O Lord, when thou comest into thy kingdom, lied in the fact that he went down in humility to confess his own iniquity and take the blame upon voluntarily upon himself. Then this word, remember me, when thou comest into thy kingdom, was Salutary, so salutary that the same day he was received into paradise. The Lord then hearkened to his prayer and accompanied him the very day into paradise. That very day into paradise. The great apostle of the Gentiles says also that God does not judge twice. He says, if we judge ourselves truly, voluntarily, we would not be judged involuntarily. In other words, if we assimilate the spirit of the great science and condemn ourselves voluntarily for our uselessness and sinfulness, then the Lord is faithful and free and faith and faith the Lord is faithful and frees us from the involuntary final judgment. He gives us the spirit that witnesses to our salvation in our heart without contradiction. It was the theme of the gospel, of the gospel passage we read today. As the same apostle affirms precisely elsewhere, elsewhere this saying is sure and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am, I am first. In the gospel we hear today, it, it, it was said that when we are taken to courts for judgment, we should not premeditate what to say, and that the spirit will be given to us, and the wisdom with which no, the, our adversaries will not be able to stand. That is to say, when we really confess our sinfulness to the Lord and we, we confess the truth of our state and because we become truthful we receive the spirit of truth which cleanses us and witnesses in us his salvation. We mustn't premeditate, simply we must go into the judgment, commending all our life to him with that consciousness and awareness we, uh, that we are useless servants. This great science inspired by the grace of God surpasses man's measure and it is unattainable in its perfection. To the degree, to the degree that the monk conforms to the spirit of God's commandments, the energy of grace increases in his soul, and thus his gratitude abounds towards Christ for the salvation he wrought for sinners. When grace becomes strong and Christ's great love touches the heart, it transmits to the monk the strength to be established in the way of the Lord, as well as the godly desire that the glory of God, our Savior, be increased while he himself decreased because of his sins.
that is that is he desires to give all the space to the heavenly guest to the primary other and leave nothing for himself St. John the Baptist is the greatest of all those born among the women exactly for this reason because he made himself the smallest though in Israel he was so great that he was taken as a messiah he put all that at the feet of our Lord he made himself the smallest and therefore God witnessed to the fact that he was the greatest St. John the theologian says that if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness so if there is an occasion when man is infallible it is when he condemns himself because of his sinfulness by becoming truthful he attracts the spirit of truth he confesses a universal truth the, law, the, the scripture says we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God likewise he that blames himself for his sins is walking on the path of God the closer the monk approaches Christ in his humble descent the closer he will be to him in his glorious ascent and thereby become partaker of the state of the risen Christ through the grace of his spirit he will be enlarged so that he will embrace in his prayer all the breath of space and time in this way he will become partaker of the universality of the new Adam and an intercessor for the entire old Adam Father Sophroni saw monasticism always as an exercise to attaining the universality of Christ then the vocation of the monk is realized and he becomes a Saint Simon says intercessor for all the world I have four pages, I hope I'm, I have four pages more, I hope I'm not tired of you, it's a bit long, man. but the, I only see, I see you very rarely, so you, you bear with me. <laughs> the twelve apostles judged that, that it was not pleasing to give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Likewise, the monks who possess the great science must not spend themselves in external service to their fellow men. It is more profitable to remain, to remain given over to the work of repentance and prayer. It can be misunderstood what I say here, but the soul of the Lord was sad unto death in earnest desire for the world's salvation. This is obvious from the words of his high priestly prayer, O righteous Father, and the world knew thee not. My mind always stops on those words when I read the 17th chapter of the Gospel of St. Of Paul. O righteous Father, and the world knew thee not. The same sadness he had in the garden of Gethsemane. In similar manner, the monk also to the degree that he shares in Christ's state is penetrated by the same sorrow because not all find salvation as St. Sirion says the work of prayer for the world is the most precious service and the world is sustained by it monks are struggling for things which have an absolute and abiding value the value of the world depends on the intercession of the righteous. The monk vacillates between two indescribable states, the ineffable bliss which, which his spirit experiences when it is immersed in the divine spirit, on one hand, and on the other hand, the deep lamentation for the salvation of the whole world. This 
two states alternate. The monk loves God, and through his love for God, he loves the world also. From the writings of St. Siluan, we know that after the Lord's exhortation to keep his mind in hell and not despair, the saint began to apply this injunction. injunction. Then he noticed with surprise a change in his state. His mind was cleansed and his soul found rest in God. In other words, putting into practice the great science brought him victory. The humble and downward movement liberates the spirit of man from the spirits of wickedness because the latter, the spirits of wickedness, wish only to go upwards and the downward, and the downward path is alien to them. <coughs> That's why we get rid of them when we, we have this awareness of our sinfulness and we condemn ourselves as useless servants. The Lord knew well when he, when he commanded us to have this awareness because he wanted to make us victorious over the enemy. So, because, so, because self-condemnation places the monk on the path of Christ's humility and attracts the grace of the Holy Spirit, it leads to victory over the passions. This victory, be it only in a few individuals, is extremely pre precious because it takes on universal dimensions. It gives stability to the life of the whole church. This victory takes place in the deep heart of man, says Father Sophroni in his introduction to the words of St. Siron. The practice of this science, as we have seen, places the monk in the way of the Lord, and the monk and places the monk in the in the way of the Lord, and the monk finds him as a companion. He makes this discovery in his deep heart, which burns within him from the presence of Christ, his fellow traveller. By following this way of repentance par excellence, the monk assimilates Christ's passion and attracts to his heart divine grace, which heals his end which heals him entirely. Those who, those who undertake self-condemnation, says in the Philokalia somewhere, they are assimilated to the passion of Christ, because it's a voluntary act, like the passion of our Lord for our salvation. Worldly passions disintegrate <coughs> man's nature, but the humility of self-humbling turns the whole of the heart and mind to God, who, as a jealous God, cannot bear sharing man's being with the adversary. The monastery is a place of thanksgiving and a place of repentance. Monasticism is an honest endeavor because it is a godly response to Christ's loving sacrifice for the world. The Lord Jesus, in order to sanctify the faithful with his divine blood, showed the immeasurable greatness of his humble love and, su and suffered, not only suffered, but he suffered outside the gate. That is to say, his suffering was extreme. There they, bear his, there they bear his reproach, those who go out of, of the camp of this world. The, monk, the monks also, in order to render their humble gratitude to the master who bought them, go outside the camp of this world as he did. There they bear his reproach and endure the shame of their spiritual poverty. This going out is not geographical, but once again it places the monk on the way of the Lord. 
It is a way of imitating the canonic love of Christ. Christ endured the cross, despising the shame, and proved himself to be wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. In this way, the humble movement of self-diminution prevails, which banishes the proud tendency towards towards self-deification. In essence, what we are speaking about is the humble downward path that heals mankind from the consequences of original sin. The fact that the acceptance of the reproach of Christ is rewarded by the enlargement brought about by the grace flowing from Christ's victorious passion is something we learn also from the Gospel narrative about Zacchaeus. This notable man of the city of Jericho, because of his desire to see Christ and because of his small stature, climbed up the sycamore tree. He did not care about the good opinion of the people and took shame upon himself, <coughs> becoming a laughing stock for the sake of Christ. But precisely this caused Christ to notice him because he saw in Zacchaeus a certain spiritual kinship with him. And that time, at that time the Lord Jesus was going up, he heading towards Jerusalem in order to be, in order to be buffeted and suffer his passion for the salvation of the world. He was heading for the cross of shame, but Zacchaeus too prophetically placed himself on the path, on the same path as Christ, and bore shame before the cross of shame. Immediately Zacchaeus had Christ not merely as a fellow traveler, but as a guest in, at his house. The Lord's visit brought, brought peace and saving grace to all the household of Zacchaeus, but above all, the Lord enlarged his heart fourfold, so as to restore his whole life. The word fourfold means no less than Zacchaeus' introduction into the mystery of the depth and height and length and breadth of the cross. In other words, the placing of Zacchaeus on the Lord's path brought him the fourfold expansion of his existence, that is, that is expan expansion to the infinite dimensions of Christ. Here I would like to make a parenthesis. On the basis of what we have already said, we can understand why the sacrament of confession has so much strength and grace. When the penitent confesses in order to be reconciled with God, he takes upon himself the shame of his sins. This act of faith is considered by the Lord as a, glad, as a grateful response to the shame which he himself bore for us. In this way, the penitent, the penitent places himself in the way of the Lord and the Lord visits him with his grace and restores his life. The, generation, the regeneration we derive from the sacrament of confession is in direct proportion to the shame we bear when we appear naked before the Lord and before his minister. The Lord then clothes us with the garment of his grace and his honor. All the strength of the monastic way lies therefore in the fact that the, man, that the man places himself in the way of the Lord, concretely and with knowledge. The great science contained in the words of the Lord to seal one, keep thy mind in hell and despair not, indicates the most excellent path, the most excellent path of the Lord. This science encompasses all the elements which make up the way of the Lord. 
it leads to union with Christ, who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of this way. L let me explain. How is it possible for a man who subjects himself to the extreme self-condemnation to hell for his sinfulness and unworthiness before such a benevolent God, known and beloved, how is it possible for him to murmur against or be shaken by illness, temptations, dishonor, deprivation, persecution, for he himself opted for the ultimate torment of hell, and as Father Sophroni used to say, he becomes a persecutor of himself to a greater degree than, than, anyone, than anyone else could persecute him. That is monasticism. Thus, under any circumstances of peace or persecution, the word of the Apostle <coughs> remains applicable. All those who desire to live piously in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, voluntary or involuntary. <coughs> the going out to bear Christ's reproach to bear so, sorry, the going out to bear Christ's reproach, which we have spoken about, gives to monasticism an apocalyptic character and, and situates it in an eschatological perspective. It creates favorable conditions for the freedom from the many cares of this life and inspires steadfast dedication to the commandments of Christ. A monastic model of life is the descent to earth of the angelic world. It serves the one and only will of God. To put it another way, the path of monastic life in its ontological perspective becomes a source of inspiration because it keeps man constantly standing before the judgment seat of Christ. The ascetics of the desert used to say that if a man wants to, between morning and evening, he can reach the divine measure. That is, in one day, there, there is though a difficulty, there is though a difficulty about this. How can one retain the inspiration so that he can abide by this measure every day? In this question, the eschatological perspective of monasticism, of monasticism helps. You notice how every time the Apostle Paul, not only he, but also the Apostles Peter and John, expounded on Christian perfection, they related it to the glorious second coming of the Lord. Take one example. St. Paul says, For the grace of God has appeared for the salvation of all men, training us to renounce irreligion and worldly passions and to live sober, upright and godly lives in this world awaiting, listen, awaiting our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. The expectation of the Lord's coming gives the believer inspiration and strength to stand steadfastly in the saving grace of God. Here is another example from St. John the Divine. See what love the, the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are, beloved. We are God's children now, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure, St. John the Divine. We acquire the elevated state of adoption when we have our hope in the manifestation of Christ in glory at the last day. In the same, in the same vein, the Apostle 
Paul to when he gives advice us for the form of this world passes away. The only thing with eternal value is the fulfillment of God's commandments. And if we have our, ourselves in an eschatological perspective, we can always keep the tension required to seek after the face of Christ because it's an event which has not happened yet and we cannot get used to it. All other events, we get used to them. The fathers speak with exhortation about the practices of the great science. It is a source of inspiration. Through self-reproach and self-condemnation, the monk stands continuously before the dread judgment seat of Christ. But since he does this voluntarily, he anticipates the eternal condemnation of the last day and receives from the Lord a mouth and wisdom, as we heard in the Gospel today, that put, that put to shame his invisible enemies. He standing before the tribunal, the tribunal of God brings contrition to the heart and unceasingly generates prayer of repentance. I'm terribly sorry. We have a couple of pages more, two pages more. In the monastic life, this science is manifested in different degrees. At the first stage, the monk humbles himself, considering himself worse than anyone else. At the second stage, he deems himself worthy of the eternal fire, and, and this banishes all passionate thoughts. But at the third stage, when the Holy Spirit comes upon him, he learns from experience the charismatic divine humility and then he loves Christ to the point of self-hate. <coughs> this, love, this love is the most perfect expression of the human person created in the image of God. Extreme self-condemnation is not for everybody not even for all monks. Its tension is too great and requires psychological wholeness. The meaning and aim of monastic life is, is considered by Archimandrite Sophroni to be total dedication to the commandments of Christ so that they become the sole law of our being. This deified state is illustrated by the perfection of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the greater love which witness to the fullness to the fullest possible likeness to Christ. So the way of monasticism constitutes a gift of the Holy Spirit. It presents upon earth the great science of the Spirit which makes known the way of God which leads to the fullness of salvation. Monasticism assures the possibility of a way of life in which God is well pleased. The monastic life is an offering to God that glorifies His name and His loving kindness. It attracts divine grace which cleanses the heart and prepares it to become a habitation of the Holy Trinity. Along this path, by the fruitful fulfillment of his vows, the monk becomes aware of his enlargement. The expansion makes him a true hypostasis, a bearer of all being, both divine and human, divine in its, in its energetical form. In this way, the monk becomes universal and his universality is sealed by his prayer for the whole Adam as for himself. Bearing in himself continuously the energy of grace, he becomes able to manifest a true royal priesthood, ministering in the Spirit for the salvation of the whole world. He becomes a fellow worker with God in the regeneration of many. Particularly, through the ascetic effort of, monast of monastic obedience, 
the monk learns to receive within himself the will and the, and the life of his fellow ascetics. In his prayer, he bears in his heart the life of the entire brotherhood. He, prog he progresses from the I of the individual to the we of all humanity. He experiences its pain and its eternal destiny as a matter of burning personal concern. Thus, monasticism becomes a spiritual locus where man can learn the great science we have spoken about and be introduced into the hypostatic form of existence, bearing within him a small brotherhood, he arrives in the end at likeness, at likeness to Christ, he becomes capable, like the Lord, of embracing the totality of humanity in time and in space. Please forgive me for the length of my paper. But I thought, I, I thought for once, uh, it doesn't matter if we speak a little bit about it. The ascetical, the ascetical way of life. Okay, thank you, Father Zacharias, for your presentation. And perhaps before we finish, uh, an opportunity for a couple of questions. I would like to ask one, if I may. You, you spoke in your presentation <clears throat> that beautiful image of turning the pyramid upside down where the person is concerned and then you turned that to the life of the church in similar fashion and and speaking of monasticism as a part of that pyramid and perhaps it's showing the way toward that light of christ in that we have our students here who are preparing to go and serve as pastors. I wonder if you could speak a word about their role in, in that greater church following the image of the ascetical life that you share. Thank you, Father Stephen, for prompting something very great. I hope. <laughs> May God give me to express it. So, the supracosmic gift of priesthood is something incredible. There is nothing upon earth like the priesthood of Christ. And the priest primarily is not he who performs sacraments. Above all is he who enters the presence of God. In every sacrament he performs, in every liturgy, he enters the presence of God. And coming out of that presence, he finds ready words in his heart to, trans to transmit to his fellows for their edification and the, their regeneration. And the more humble we are, like in the path of monasticism, the more humble we are in our presentation before the altar of God, the more, less daring we are when we approach the throne of grace, the more grace and boldness we, find, we will find to enter his presence and there come out of that presence enriched with the word of God. Let the word of God dwell in your hearts richly, says St. Paul. And when the word of God dwells richly in our hearts, then we can truly minister to our fellows for their salvation. And you know, we don't, not only we have to humble ourselves to enter the presence of God, but we have to humble ourselves before the people we, we serve. Unless we put ourselves under the people who come to receive our help, we will not be able to inform their heart with the word and with the grace of God that accompanies that word. The more we humble ourselves before the people, the more they were convinced in God, they were convinced by the grace of God, and the more progress they will make. It's very important to put ourselves under the people we serve. 
When people come and confess to us, if we see especially if the people come with, with shame and contrition, then we must put utterly ourselves below them because the hand of God is upon them working their regeneration and we mustn't stop that work. We must be poor instruments for that work. It's a charismatic work. It's a really a great work to be a priest. It means to be a co-worker with Christ for the salvation of many. And as he had to humble himself utterly to the end with his sacrifice in order to bring the grace of the cross and resurrection, the grace of salvation to us, so we have to humble ourselves in order to transmit this grace to our fellows. Forgive me. <coughs> Other questions for Father Zacharias? Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Father, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, your vision, particularly of the monastic life, but I think also what you just said for the priesthood life, that, that this will apply also. The difference between the vision and what I think tomorrow morning when I go back to my, when we get to our monastery and I go to my office, and I spend all day in my office because I work in, the, in, in that administration, uh, I, it's, it, there's just too big a difference. So how do I apply this in my daily life? How does this, how do I make this real, the vision that you give? If you have this vision, slowly, slowly, everything will conform to this vision. And you don't start your day by working in the office. You start, you start your day by getting up in yourself before your work and pouring out your soul, your heart to God. And if you do that properly, the energy of that will prepare you for the rest of the day and accompany you for the rest of the day. As the psalm says, I was prepared and I was not troubled. If we, if we humble ourselves and we pour out our heart before the Lord, He will fill it with the good grace, with the good energy of His grace, which will accompany us and keep us with a humble spirit, whatever we do, whatever we say, whatever we think. As I once said to my brethren at the monastery, let's make it a rule. I said it the other day, let's make it a rule. In whatever we do, in whatever we say, in whatever we, we think one for another, to add the portion of the humble love of Christ. And at the end, we'll inherit the fullness of His divine love. Father, uh, yesterday you spoke about, uh, obviously it's the Sunday of the prodigal. How do we, how do we live in our hearts the, the life of the prodigal, or what you've spoken about um, in asceticism, without an outward, an exterior piety? Um, how, how, do we, how do we live this pain and tension of the heart without um, displaying it in, in our because I see uh, joy in an awful lot of uh, holy people, but sometimes I'm confused. I think, I think the answer is contained to what we said before. In the Old Testament, the people of God in the desert of Sinai, they received the manna from God, which became to each one according to his need. In this life, if we repent, and bear a certain wound in our heart, which we ought to. If we are God's descendants, the new people of Israel, God's descendants, we mark our belonging to Him with the circumcision of the heart. We should have a constant pain in our heart. And this pain, will be, it is the manna of the New Testament. It will, it will not leave us one moment to forget to whom we, him to whom we belong. We mustn't just believe in Christ, but we must love him in whom we believe. And 
this will not leave us one moment to forget him if there is a scratch in our heart. A scratch which will work in our private, in our secret room, not to be seen of men and receive the, uh, the, receive the, the praise of men, but in the secret, seen by God, and keep secretly this wound in our heart, which will remind us continually that we belong to him, is the seal of our belonging to him, is the circumcision of the new people of Israel, that we believe in his word and follow him. Like the old people of Israel, they receive the circumcision of the flesh to show their belief in the word and expectation of the Lord and their, their belonging to the chosen people of God. The new Israel must have a circumcision of the heart, the spiritual pain of the heart which does not let us forget one moment that we belong to him. We can only become sinless, sinless in inverted commas, if we have this pain in our heart, which is the manna of the New Testament. And, it be, and especially for the priests, it will, become, it will become a wondrous grace to be able to weep with them that weep and rejoice with them that rejoice. Otherwise, when you be priest, you cannot put a, a notice on your confession on the room where you confess and say, from 8 to 10, I receive people who rejoice. From 10 to 12, people who, who grieve and who, who suffer. But you receive one after another an alternate in this and be a comforter of souls to each one according to his need, if you have the, this inner man, inner spiritual man of the New Testament in you. Thank you again, Father Zacharias. Um, I know if you have any other questions, and we'll have a little bit of time before you leave us at noon uh, for others to, to ask questions. But it has been a real joy to experience you with us here today literally experience of being taken by the hand and, and very gently and compassionately shown this ascetic way in life. And I really uh, appreciate very much your being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we finish. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, Deacon Moses, I will be ordained to the priesthood. Uh, we're gathering at 6.30 with liturgy beginning at 6.50. And we look forward to that. Tomorrow evening we'll be gathering uh, with Cindy Davis on a topic of a very different nature uh, relating to sexual misconduct, which all of our students are asked to uh, gather tomorrow evening. Uh, and our monastery community is welcome to come and be with us as well as she will be with us. And uh, lastly, um, Sergei uh, Arhapov, our registrar and librarian, will likely be returning to us at some point and just want to again relay that his sister passed away who had been ill. And um, so I'm hopeful that when he returns, uh, we may be able to uh, organize together with uh, Father Sergius a memorial service together with him with our seminary community if um, you will find that acceptable. But just as you see him when he returns to the campus, um, his sister's name is Anna. So, uh, maybe we can uh, conclude with, it is truly me. <laughs>